Hi, I'm Libby Dankman with KPCC and LAist, here with five keys for voting in California. Check your voter registration status and watch your mailbox. California is mailing every active registered voter a ballot this year because of the coronavirus pandemic. But don't go on autopilot. Make sure that you're registered and confirm that your local elections office has your current mailing address. One clue, you should have already gotten some snail mail reminders about voting from your registrar. I know, you might have thrown them out. Mail-in ballots start going out October 5th. If you don't see yours by the following week, contact your county's registrar. Seal your ballot in the official envelope and remember to sign the outside. More than two thirds of Californians already vote by mail, but this might be your first time. The full packet will have your ballot, an optional secrecy sleeve, the return envelope, and your I Voted sticker. Once you've filled out your ballot, place it back in the envelope and don't forget your signature. A rule of thumb is to sign the way you did on your driver's license. There's more than one way to cast that ballot. You can mail it back. As long as your ballot is postmarked on or before election day, it has 17 days to make it to the registrar's office. Or you can drop it off at a secure ballot drop box, like this one here, or at a polling place or a vote center. Track your ballot and make sure it's counted. The Secretary of State offers a nifty Track My Ballot service so you can monitor your ballot's progress. If your mail-in ballot is rejected for any reason, usually that happens because of a mismatched signature, by state law, your registrar has to contact you and let you fix it. You can still vote in person. If you need any help with your mail-in ballot or you lose it, no problem. Counties will be operating voting locations with COVID-19 safety measures. In Los Angeles and Orange counties, some vote centers will be open for 11 days. There's even one at Dodger Stadium. Hopefully you have a great experience. If you have any questions, contact our voter game plan team at LAist.com. Good evening. On behalf of KPCC and LAist, welcome to the first installment of our Voter Game Plan virtual event series dedicated to helping you get ballot ready. My name is John Cohn and I manage live programming and events for KPCC and LAist. Next up in this series, on Tuesday, September 29th, business reporter David Wagner, education reporter Kyle Stokes, and guests weigh the pros and cons of Proposition 15. Then on Thursday, October 1st, who you just saw right there, senior politics reporter Libby Denkman and guests will answer your questions about the what's, when's, where's, and why's of voting in 2020. And there's more. Check out the rest of the series at kpcc.org slash in person. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to be the first to find out about all of our events. This evening, my colleague Adolfo Guzman Lopez leads a conversation exploring the pros and cons of Proposition 16 a ballot measure that would repeal Proposition 209, which has prohibited California from considering race, ethnicity, and gender in hiring and contracting for all government-run institutions and for admissions to public universities. We invite you to gauge with us throughout the event and your fellow attendees in the chat section. If you're in a position in which you can support KPCC and LAist, we're always grateful for anything you can do. Go to support.kpcc.org slash in person. And thank you again for joining us this evening. Without further ado, KPCC and LAist higher education correspondent, Adolfo Guzman Lopez. Hey, welcome to everybody uh, from KPCC's Downtown Los Angeles Bureau. This is not a virtual backdrop. This is the actual studio where uh, the magic gets made on radio. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Uh, while we're not currently able to convene in our Crawford Family Forum, in Pasadena, where we would typically have these. We do want to acknowledge Gordon and Donna Crawford for making our virtual programming possible. Uh, tonight, we're going to have about uh, half a dozen guests. We'll hear about uh, Prop 16 from both the uh, pro campaign, the anti campaign. We're also going to hear uh, from experts, people who can talk about what's at stake in Proposition 16. Uh, that's going to be on the November ballot. And we're also going to hear um, personal stories, uh, people who've been affected, who have very strong views about uh, this measure. Uh, now, let's begin the program with the basics of what Proposition 16 would and would not do from the nonpartisan body, uh, the California Legislative Analyst Office. That office studies all ballot measures and provides impartial analysis and assesses their fiscal effects. Earlier, I talked to Lourdes Morales. She's a principal analyst for that office. 
Lourdes Morales with the Legislative Analyst Office. Thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. How would Proposition 16 change public institutions like the California State University and the University of California? Sure. Well, if approved, the measure would repeal Proposition 209, which was authorized by voters in 1996, and would therefore eliminate the ban on the consideration of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin as it relates to education, employment, and contracting. As a result, local entities, including the state's public universities, would be able to establish a wider range of policies that consider these characteristics. One of the key caveats, though, is that these uh, entities would still have to comply with federal and state law, which have constitutional provisions to ensure for equal protection of all. So there are, though, some exceptions to the wording that Prop 209 introduced into the state constitution. Talk, talk to me a little bit about what those exceptions are. Sure, so there's really two main exceptions that are in place now under 209. The first is that today, state and local entities can consider sex as long as it's a necessary part of normal operations. So for example, the state could consider the gender of an employee related to state prisons. If it's important for the employee and the inmate to be of the same gender in the operation of that work, that's okay under Prop 209. Additionally, state and local entities can consider these characteristics if it's required under federal law. One of the key areas where that's true is in transportation, where the state is required to set goals to ensure that a portion of contracts go to certain groups as a condition of receiving some federal funding. So for example, ensuring that uh, businesses owned by women or people of color have some representation there. So that's true today. Okay. So this consideration of race by public institutions has been known as affirmative action. And uh, it was used, uh, consideration of race was used uh, by public institutions in California up until 90, 1996 when Prop 209 uh, was approved. Would the passage of Prop 16, which would do away with those provisions, would that automatically compel the University of California, California State University, and other institutions to right away start using affirmative action? No, the measure isn't, uh, doesn't make any requirements on state or local entities. What it does is it repeals those prohibitions that were established by 209 and therefore gives the discretion to local governments and, and the state to institute policies that do consider those policies. Um, so as a result, there's no direct fiscal effect since there is no mandate under the provision. It would be based on the decisions of the future state and local entity uh, individuals to make those decisions for themselves and set forward those policies. Uh, but nothing would happen automatically on day one short of decisions coming down the road. So th those decisions would come from, say, the uh, U University of California Regents, uh, the California State University Board of Trustees, or, or city councils, right? That's right. Local governments that do their own hiring as well. Something uh, you said earlier, I think, is one of the key elements of, of Prop 209. So the campaign leading up to 209 promised two things, and it, and it was in the wording of the proposition. So Prop 209 would uh, ban consideration of race and other factors in, in by public institutions in, in certain situations. It would also ban discrimination by these public institutions. So the campaign to pass Prop 209 really pushed those two ideas. So um, you know, I want you to get into this a little bit more. Would the doing away of Prop 209 allow for discrimination by public institutions? So even before Prop 209, um, when there were these broader policies that considered race, sex, color, ethnicity, and national origin, all these programs still had to comply with federal and state law in this area. So the federal and the state constitutions have provisions related to equal protection, which generally means that people in similar situations needed to be treated similarly under the law. And so there's a number of factors that any program would need to comply with to ensure that they're not discriminating in a way that uh, 
the way that uh, violates these equal protection requirements. And so this is again true under federal and state law. And so what the measure would do is broaden the number of programs or type of programs that could operate um, if the measure would go into effect. But these safeguards under the federal and state constitution and law would remain in effect even if Proposition 16 went into um, effect per voters. One of the most important things the California Legislative Analyst Office does is measure the fiscal impact, right? How much money a policy proposal is going to cost uh, California taxpayers. If Prop 16 is approved, uh, how much would Prop 16 and its changes cost taxpayers? So and on day one, there would be no direct fiscal effect. As you mentioned, the measure doesn't require the state or local governments or, or universities to make any changes. Any cost related to the measure would come down the road if state or local entities decide to institute programs that consider these characteristics. Well, Lourdes Morales with the Legislative Analyst Office, thanks a lot for joining us and explaining uh, all these things and, and talking about your analysis of Prop 16. Happy to be with you, thank you. And so from that very uh, nonpartisan uh, point of view, let's dive right into the partisan views about Prop 16. We're gonna start with the Yes on 16 campaign. I'm joined by Eva Patterson. She's the co-chair of the Yes on 16 campaign. She's also president of the Equal Justice Society. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us tonight, Eva. Let's, let's hear the, the, the strongest pitch you've got. And you've been making these pitches. You've been working hard. Um, I, I had to convince you to come on, to leave the phone. And, and uh, so why should voters vote yes on Prop 16? California has the seventh largest economy in the world and it's not acting fairly. People of color, uh, women, we're not getting our fair share. The pay, playing field is not level at all. Just to give one example, a small example, uh, Dr. Weber of some San Diego had a program for girls to help them in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. That program was struck down because of Proposition 209. Similarly, the state personnel board wanted to make sure there was not discrimination against people of color and women. But when they tried to do that, Proposition 209, no, no, no. I was admitted to UC Berkeley Law School in the fall of 1972. There were 30 black students in my class. The year after affirmative action was eliminated, there was one black student in the class. One of the most uh, uh, astounding statistics to me around kind of the entrepreneurial nature of California is this. In the past 24 years, businesses owned by women and people of color have lost $1 billion a year a billion dollars a year because they didn't get government contracts that are funded by our tax dollars. So before Proposition 209, we were able to have remedies for discrimination. 209 just pulled the rug out from under the state and it's a bit to the detriment of people of color and women. So you, you got some, your side got some bad news recently. The Public Policy Institute uh, of California showed very low support for Proposition 16. Uh, what's your reaction to their very reliable um, counting and polling of likely voters in California? A couple of responses. About 80% of the public has not even heard of Proposition 16. I was talking to a very progressive DJ up here in Oakland and he hadn't heard about it at all. Um, I was part of a focus group with African-Americans from Los Angeles. When you read the language of the initiative to them, they went, I'm not voting for that. After about 10 minutes of talking about the fact that it restores affirmative action, they all came over to our side. Um, we also know that validators and villains are very much a part of this process. Kamala Harris, the co-founders of uh, Black Lives Matter who are on the cover of Time Magazine today. The PTA, Dr. Bernice King, the daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King, all for this. Um, we believe that Trump is against affirmative action. We know that Pete Wilson was very much against this back in the day. So when it becomes clear to the voters who's on which side and what this is about, they come to our side. We actually did some polling. Our original polling showed us below 50%. And once we put the messages out, we got over 50%. But, but Eva, with weeks left until the election, are you going to be able to reach enough 
voters to be able to convince them of all of this message? Um, we drop our first TV ads on Monday. And the way you win in California is through TV. There'll be a, a massive focus on the LA area where about, I think, a lot of the vote is. So we feel once people know what this is about, they will come our way. And this was very much um, demonstrated when we did our focus groups. You know, it, uh, my analysis of those uh, low uh, approval numbers was that it seemed, from what I've read of your side, it doesn't seem like you're communicating that something is broken. You know, it's succinctly saying something is broken that needs to be fixed by the electorate, by this ballot proposition. Well, what's your response to that? Well, that isn't borne out by our focus groups. Once we start talking about what's happening and the statistics, the fact that 90% of businesses owned by people of color did not get that payroll protection plan, one half of 1% of contracting dollars go to black businesses. Once people hear these facts, they go, oh, we're with you. But if you just read the language, we had to use the language from 209. In order to repeal 209, you have to use the language of 209. It's very confusing. And all we have to do, and it's done very quickly in focus groups, is we say, this is what it does. It restores equal opportunity. It chips away at systemic racism. The whole movement about the racial reckoning that's been brought to life by the murder of Mr. George Floyd gets all Americans to see that uh, there is a problem of race in America. The majority of white Americans favor affirmative action. So once you explain to people what it's about, they come our way. So come back and talk to me in two weeks after our ads drop. We have digital ads. We have people from Hollywood who are going to be talking about this. George Legend, John Legend is for Prop 16. Magic Johnson, I could go on and on and on. Right. So um, if we thought we couldn't win, we would have stopped back in June. But we've always known we started below 50%. We always knew that. But when we put our messages out, the public comes, the public comes with us. Well, th thanks a lot, Eva Patterson. Uh, she's the uh, co-chair of the Yes on 16 campaign. And uh, just as I uh, move on to our next guest, let me talk a little bit about the, the support on both sides. So on the Yes on 16 campaign, there are a lot of uh, the names in California Democratic elected politics. So everybody from um, Senator Dianne Feinstein to Senator Kamala Harris, uh, a lot of local elected officials, the mayor of Oakland, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of money behind it too. Uh, labor unions, the umbrella organization for the teachers union, is also supporting the yes on 16. A lot fewer supporters for the no on 16 uh, camp, but uh, I'm, I have Gail Harriet. She's the professor of law at uh, University of San Diego, and actually one of the original proponents of Prop 209. Uh, 25 years ago. Gail, thanks a lot for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, we really well, appreciate thank you. you for having me, though I do want to correct you on, oh, on who yes. has more supporters. It's hard to look at the polls where we are way ahead and say that, that the yes side has more supporters. Uh, we have the supporters that matter. That is the ones that actually are going to be voting. You are correct, however, that they have the money. Um, they have um, over $10 million now, and I can tell you we have a tiny fraction of that. On the other hand, we've got the volunteers. Um, we've got the, 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 the volunteers who would walk through fire to make sure that something like this um, is understood by the public. Um, and remember, Prop 16, you know, it's all about removing from the state constitution words that I consider to be very precious. Uh, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting. That's what it's about. Um, and I think when people see that, um, you know, their reaction is those words are important. And moreover, when, when they learn more about it, um, they realized that Prop 209 has been a great success for California. For example, um, Duke economist Peter Arcidiacono and his co-investigators looked at the effects of Proposition 209 a few years after it went into effect. What did they find? They found that it had increased 
uh, graduation rates for underrepresented minorities. It had increased uh, grade point averages for underrepresented minorities. And it had also increased the number of science and engineering degrees uh, for underrepresented minorities. It's hard to look at that and not see a great success. Uh, and it happens because students are going to the school where their academic credentials put them in the same ballpark with other students. In addition, they look at the fact that shortly after Prop 209 went into effect, the University of California finally got smart um, and started not looking at race uh, or sex is the way you can identify who is in need, but looking at actual need. That is, they do give a leg up for students uh, who are from low income neighborhoods, uh, whose parents didn't get a chance to go to college. That's right. Those are these are the workarounds that we were talking about. Let me take let me take two ideas. Not a workaround, though, isn't it better? Isn't that what we should be doing in the first place? I mean, <laughs> let me yeah. Let, let me take two uh, two ideas exactly that you introduced. A good idea. Right. So so on the disc the discrimination element of Prop Two Hundred Nine that's now in the state constitution, th if you do away with that, there are already provisions in the state constitution and federal provisions that don't oh, allow my. discrimination. Oh my, if you look at the Supreme Court decisions interpreting those, those, those statutes, uh, for example, Title VI, which would apply to, to admissions um, for students uh, at the University of California because the University of California accepts federal funds, uh, but the guts were ripped out of that case many years ago. Um, and so in fact, Federal law does permit discrimination. Um, the case that, that so, so are you I saying know, that the state part provisions? Part are you saying that the state provisions um, keep a dis, uh, you know, prevent discrimination al allowed by that? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is Prop 209 corrected um, the misinterpretations of Title VI, uh, and it, here in California, at least, we do what Congress actually intended when they passed Title VI in 1964, rather than what the Supreme Court has allowed universities to do, uh, which is very far from what was intended by Congress back in 1964. Uh, they have essentially taken, um, taken the guts out of it. Um, at public universities today and private universities as well, uh, all over the country, but not in states like California and states that have, have passed initiatives like Prop 209, uh, the preferences that are granted to, to, to students. And as I said, this isn't a question of need, it's simply a question of race. And they are equal to hundreds of SAT right. school points. Right. Uh, at Gail, the University of Gail, Michigan, for example. Let, let me interrupt real quick and, and ask you about the news that's been coming out um, the last couple of, last well, probably two years about preferential treatment in admissions. The college admissions scandal is definitely an example of preferential treatment, uh, illegal preferential treatment. An audit just this week found that in the University of California, there were backdoor uh, ways to get in uh, used. Um, so, th so this system of admissions- And it's ghastly, isn't it? It's ghastly. And you know something? Ward yeah. Connerly, who chairs the, the, the No on Prop 16 campaign, worked very hard to prevent those kind of, 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 of preferences. Um, and guess what? Uh, it's the anti-209 people uh, that seem to think that preferences of that sort were just fine. Um, I strongly believe we should come down very hard on that kind of preference. Uh, but why would you want to add more discretion on the part of the University of California, especially when the University of California can already and does grant a little leg up to people who are actually in need. Right actually right. low income, right. um, actually had parents who didn't have a chance to go, 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 go to college. You know, you're talking about, gee, you know, they go and they, they, they do these bad things. So we should give them more power to do more bad things. So Gary, what would you no say, what, what would you say to people who remember Prop 209 as, as being a very divisive measure? We know that Prop 209 in 1996 was uh, largely approved by the white electorate, um, black, Latino, Asian 
voters who turn 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 who why is it divisive? We're not the moving party here. We're the no side, remember? Uh, we're the ones that say we should keep the Constitution the way it is. I mean, it really does seem a bit unfair uh, to say that we're the ones being, being, being divisive. I mean, that's just silly. Um, and another thing that people frequently do is they say this was Prop 209 was political. It was intended to, to benefit, you know, particular politician, uh, Governor Wilson. But in fact, Prop 209 was the brainchild of an anthropologist named Glenn Custrid and a philosopher named Tom Wood, uh, two academics who very strongly felt that race preferential admissions were causing harm to students. So and Gail, to, to wrap up, what's, your, what's gonna be your approach in the last, these last few weeks? Uh, who are you reaching out to? Who's gonna, who's gonna carry the vote? Uh, for the well, nice um, you know, we, we don't have the money that the yes side has. They've got, as I've said, over $10 million. We don't have anything close to that. Um, and so we're going to try our best to get our, our message out. Uh, we are very grateful um, to, to you for holding this, this, this discussion, uh, as we are grateful to anyone who will hold the discussion uh, for us. We have to, you know, do the best we can. Uh, but remember, um, we're the underdogs in the sense of fundraising. This is big business for that side. Remember, public contracting is a big deal. And there are people that very much want uh, to get preferential treatment based on race or sex. Uh, they've got the money. You wouldn't believe how much more money they have. I am actually a law professor and by no means rich. And I'm the second largest donor to the, to the, to the No on 16 campaign. Uh, that tells you uh, what you need to know. Great. Very Thanks little a lot. money here. Most of our donations are like a hundred dollars, and we have more of them, many more than Thank they you, do. Thank you, Dale. We're, go, we're, we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on to our other guests. Thanks a lot for joining us. Really appreciate it. So uh, before I move on to our, our next two guests, um, something that Gail brought up is very important to say, which is that uh, the elimination of a ban on affirmative action would also would also affect uh, public contracts. So this is so not something uh, we're touching on in this um, in this forum. We we discussed it, but that is such a such a big issue. Um, so I encourage all of you who are going out uh, November third to vote to read up on that, to read up on the public contracting impact of that. So for now, we're just focusing on the higher education impact of Prop sixteen, and one of the people who's been looking a lot at uh, the numbers in the last 24 years uh, as to how a, a ban on affirmative action has affected, affected higher education is Richard Sander. He's a professor of law at UCLA. He's an opponent of Prop 16. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is uh, talk to Richard Sander, then we're going to bring uh, another guest on, and then we're going to have a little bit of a back and forth. So, so Richard, tell me about this data that you've been collecting for years. I don't, show, I don't want you to throw it all at me right now, but tell me, what's, what are the most telling numbers that you've collected that show the impact of uh, Prop 209, a ban on affirmative action uh, at the University of California? Well, it's great to be here, Adolfo. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess there are three numbers that really strike me. So one is that before 209, the number of African-Americans and, and Hispanics uh, both applying and getting into the UC system was very flat for quite a long time. From 1989 to 1997, really didn't change. Uh, and then after 2009, the number of Black and Hispanic applications started skyrocketing, you know, like uh, tripled for Blacks and quadrupled for Hispanics over the next decade. So why was that? Well, you know, a lot of it goes to this issue, the distinction between affirmative action and, and, and racial preferences. Um, what, uh, what's often muddled is that uh, Prop 209 did not ban most forms of affirmative action. It only banned actual preferential treatment. And the University of California actually launched a whole bunch of affirmative action programs after Prop 209. They started forming partnerships with uh, schools in uh, underperforming areas. They started making sure that, that low socioeconomic students uh, 
knew about the A to G requirements for the university. Uh, they started having on-campus welcoming programs, things like that. They didn't you're stretching the definition of affirmative action, though. That's not that's not the widely accepted view, but just yeah, to but, underline. But, it, but it's clearly what happened. I mean, there's no question that, that the university just started investing heavily in outreach after 2009, because I think, I mean, in my view, it's because they couldn't rely on racial preferences to sort of achieve their diversity goals. And and it produced this, this huge growth. Um, the second thing that's really amazing is that Black and Hispanic students started accepting offers from the university at higher rates after Prop 2 and I went into effect, which really mitigated the impact. It, it meant that there were many more Black and Hispanic students going. So why was that? Well, you know, I think a reasonable explanation is that students liked the idea of going to a school where there wasn't sort of the cloud of uh, whether they'd gotten in on a preference. The third thing is that, and Gail mentioned this, is that performance levels of underrepresented minorities went up dramatically after Prop 209. Um, the four-year graduation rate at UCLA in the mid-90s was 13.5% for African-Americans. They went up to about 45% within 10 years of the passage of Prop 209. And I agree with, with what Gail said, that that was largely because students were better matched uh, at the specific campus where they could flourish and it just had a dramatic impact. Thanks, thanks a lot. I'd like to bring in uh, Cecilia Stolano. She's a regent with the University of California and a Prop 16 supporter. So now, um, Cecilia, this section is about numbers. It's about data. So tell me, uh, get, tell me about the numbers that you're looking at that show the impact of Prop 209 over the last uh, uh, 24 years. So it's interesting. Um, Dr. Sander talks about broad numbers. He doesn't talk about percentage and it's all about cherry picking data, right? What we know that happened directly after Prop 209 passed is that the number of applicants from underrepresented minorities plummeted. We also saw that the proportion of the entering class of underrepresented minorities also plummeted. So this mismatch problem that Dr. Sander talks about, what really happened is uh, African-American and Latino students got the message. They were not welcome at the University of California and so they didn't apply. Thousands, literally thousands of students who were qualified to apply and be admitted into the University of California simply didn't apply. Instead, they applied to Cal State or they just went straight to a community college or they went out of state. Interestingly, when Dr. Sander talks about how the rate of the acceptance of black students increased, it's because the number of black students or the percentage of black students relative to their percentage in the population decreased dramatically. Let me tell you, Eva also, I also went to the University of California Bolt School of Law, Berkeley School of Law, and I was at this university at law school when we went from having the most diverse class to the least diverse class within the top 10. So we had one black student who joined the freshman class uh, while I was at Bolt. So look, this is not, this is a numbers game for Dr. Sander, but what this is really about is opportunity. We wanna do in California is provide opportunity, equal opportunity to everyone in this state, regardless of their race or ethnicity. It's in the constitution and not through 209. It's in the organic law that created the University of California. And what we've done with 209, what we've done is basically prohibited folks from talking about the reality of structural racism that exists here in California and across the United States. We all know it. And the murder of George Floyd actually created this outpouring of people recognizing the reality of life, even here in the great state of California. So let's talk about a little bit more data. Why did the number of Latinos increase at the University of California? Very simple. The proportion of Latinos in the population grew dramatically. At the same time, the University of California expanded the number of seats in the entering class through the 1990s and the 2000s. What's the so mismatch? That a raw, I'm sorry, go ahead, Adolfo. Yeah, yeah what, Cecilia, what is the percentage? There, there, there's a number that you've pointed yeah. out about qualified Latinos graduating from California high schools and those actually sure. making it it in, what are, what's the difference in those proportions? When Latinos grow dramatically as proportion of, of high school students, and we feel really good about that, and we say, oh my goodness, this is terrific because Latinos comprise 24% of the entering class of the University of California. 
great unless you know that they are 54% of the 12th grade class in public schools. So they're no, they are in no way proportional to their representation in the population of the school age students that are qualified to go to the University of California. So this is simply playing with numbers. We know the reality. We know that students in K through 12 who are in predominantly Latino schools have much less access to the A through G courses that are prerequisites to getting into okay. the University of California. We know the same about African-American students. They don't have the same access to A through G classes. Okay. They don't have the same access to AP courses. We need to understand the reality. You cannot fix what you cannot name. And what Prop 209 did was to force us to lie about the reality of structural racism in the state of California. Uh, Richard, let me let me ask you, is this is this struggle over affirmative action and possibly allowing it back a struggle less about the, no. the data and more about ideology, what we no. as a society um, value? Well, I think the first thing I need to say is that Regent Estolano doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, when you say that the number of applications plummeted from underrepresented minorities, what data are you referring to? I'm looking at I'm looking at the I'll, I'll, I'll give you time to respond, Cecilia. So you'll you'll get time to respond. Make yeah, notes. I'm looking at the UC Info Center data right now. It's right up online in front of me, which the regents put up. The African American application numbers in 1997 were 2304. In 1998, the first year of Prop 209's implementation, they were 2346. The next year they were 2476. The next year they were 2623. By 2017, there were near 10,000. So the region is simply making things up. Uh, I hate to say this because she's my boss's boss's boss, but you know, you've got to get your facts right. I'm not playing with that. I'm looking at the real data. The second thing I want to correct is this idea that uh, Hispanic representation has gone down. So no, I did not say that. I did uh, not say that. It has gone up, but not yes, in proportion. I know, I know. To but you're saying relative to high school right. graduations, you're saying relative to high school graduates, it's gone down. The actual numbers are that Hispanic uh, students as a proportion of UC freshmen in 1997, the last year before Prop 209, was 13%. Correct. It was 32% in 2017. That's a 19 point increase. During that period, the proportion of Hispanics among high school graduates in California went up 14 points. So the proportionate representation of Hispanics went up faster in absolute and relative terms. So let's, not, let's stop making up data. Let's deal with real information. We're not making Richard, it so, so let me give, uh, I have a question for Richard then I'm gonna move on to you, Cecilia. Sure. Um, so, so Richard, the both the California State University um, uh, trustees and the UC regents are supporting Prop 16. Now those bodies are by no stretch of the imagination far left liberal bodies. So they are, they are uh, overseeing both the fiscal and curriculum direction of those two very important university system. What does it say to you that the bodies of those two university systems say that doing away with 209 is a, is a good idea? I think we have a serious pathology with the regents now. Um, the University of California Office of the President and the regents are sort of in a mutual delusion game where they're, they're afraid to talk about reality. Their debates sound like echo chambers. They don't let in divergent views. So last April, uh, they considered this issue of whether to get rid of the SAT as a requirement for UC. There was a, an academic Senate body of distinguished faculty members who unanimously said, we should not do this. And the regents unanimously voted to do it. That means they're not listening to their faculty. They're not, they're not listening to the people who well, are Richard, actually but, Yeah, to but Richard, you've seen, uh, you, you've seen the, the research that shows that higher scores on the SAT are largely a reflection of the amount of money you or your family That's have absolutely to false prepare. Offer. Adolfo, you haven't read the research if you believe that. It's been shown by a whole series of scholars that not only is the correlation between SAS, uh, socioeconomic status and scores relatively low, but it's also the case that scores do not uh, underpredict the performance of minority students. So the whole premise of the argument that this is somehow a backdoor form of discrimination is just unsound. The faculty pointed out all sorts of ways that you can use test scores and without compromising diversity goals. And the regents just blew it off. Okay. So Adolfo, yeah, I'm so thank, glad thank that, that Dr. Yeah. Sander mentioned the academic Senate because they came out strongly in favor of Proposition 16. 
they came out in favor of placing this on the ballot. In fact, everybody in higher education in, a, in an area of responsibility has come out in favor of this. Why? Because we share the values of equal opportunity. Let's be clear. We're among only nine states in this country that prohibit the consideration of race, right? Only nine states. Why would we tie one hand behind our back when we're trying to achieve equal opportunity in this state of California? And we haven't even really talked about contracting at all. I know that's for a different form. That, that's a separate issue. But, uh, but let on, me tell you, that's real. On Air Talk uh, recently, when one of our programs, we had some uh, callers chime in about uh, Prop 16, and quite a few of them talked about quotas. There, there's a really very strong perception in the public uh, and anger about quotas. People don't want quotas. And, and well, they're we'll, illegal. We'll let, so we'll, they're we'll illegal. Let, and at this UC, UC right. Board of Regents, at the same That's you know, what I our last to meeting into. last week, we actually passed a policy uh, declaring that we would not use quotas. It's illegal. And that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about being able to actually address an issue of structural racism, call it for what it is, and then design programs that might combat it. We don't know exactly what those programs will look like, but we're not even allowed to have a real conversation about a real factor. You know, I will talk, talk to you, talk about academics. I commend people to read The Color of Law by another University of California professor, Richard Rothstein, that documents how the legal profession, urban planners like, you know, from my profession, urban planning, how we created structural legal discrimination in this state and across the United States. And that has been baked into residential segregation patterns that then gets reflected into the availability of good schools for people of color. So, 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 so if you the, wanna the, talk about data, why don't we talk about history and data, but let's talk about principles and values. And that's really what this is about, equal opportunity. So these measures that the University of California and California State University have taken over the last 24 years, reaching out to uh, students in low-income communities um, and, and those sort of programs, why aren't those enough from here on out um, to reach Black and Latino students who, you know, need, um, you know, need, yeah. you know, need to Look, get they're in. great programs. We know that they work. We also know that after one big bump of funding, they've been declining actually quite a bit over the last 20 years. There just hasn't been the same sustained funding. So, you know, we play with a broad brush. We kind of do a scattershot approach. We know some good programs, but it would be a lot more effective to be able to target the problem and call it for what it is. Yeah. So what we need is a targeted response for a variety of issues. These are helpful programs, but they're not the end all, right? There just aren't. What we really do need to talk about is, let's. You know, right now we're in the COVID pandemic. We're doing this by Zoom, right? Because we're having a public health emergency. You wanna know a real impact of Prop 209 is that we saw the number of black and Latino doctors plummet. It has not kept pace with the increase in population. It has not kept pace. So we have the same proportion of black and Latino doctors that we need at a time when it is disproportionately hitting our population. Thank you very much. So uh, that was Cecilia Stolano. She's a UC regent. And I also talked to Richard Sander. R Richard, I gave both of you guys two, two segments. So um, we have limited time, okay. but I will um, you know, point people to reach out to both of you. Um, if they want more information, uh, because I want to get into some of the personal stories behind uh, Prop 16. Um, let me introduce Tony Guan. He's a board member with the Silicon Valley Chinese Association Foundation and founder of uh, StopProp16.org. Now, one of the reasons that I looked to groups like Silicon Valley Chinese Association Foundation is that um, opponents of Prop 16, uh, some of them are Chinese immigrant groups. Uh, some of those voices have been very strong. Um, so Tony, um, you, I talk, when I talked to you earlier, you told me that you moved to the United States from China about 12 years ago. You feel very strongly about the United States as a meritocracy. You've done well for yourself. You've worked in tech in the Silicon Valley. Do, do your views about meritocracy come from things you experienced growing up in China? 
Uh, we did. Uh, actually, I am by no means uh, any uh, privileged people. So I came here 12 years ago and I had a toughest time that I could not pay my rent. And I was uh, on, the, uh, on the, in the valley of my life. I had to ask uh, friends for help to pay the rents and uh, to, uh, to afford this uh, high cost of living here. Uh, eventually, I got a job, and um, I steadily uh, um, on the way to achieve my uh, American dream. Uh, living happily until this year, and uh, proper 16 was out. So I, I immediately noticed that, okay, this sounds really familiar. And this, this was something happened 60 years ago in China. Uh, back, in, back that time, uh, it, it was in uh, Cultural Revolution time. Right, so you might have heard about it. So if someone was unfortunate enough to be born in, uh, from some bad family, right, in the definition of the government, then, um, then for their whole life, they will be treated very unfairly and very badly. Um, you do acknowledge, this purpose, yeah. You, you do acknowledge yeah. though that the United States is not a pure meritocracy. There are, as I talked about earlier, uh, we've been seeing examples of preferential treatment given to people in college admissions, people who have money, people who have access. There's also, you could also call the uh, money used to prepare for the SAT as a sort of preferential treatment. What, what's your response to those examples? Yeah, I, my response is that, uh, remember uh, VJ, uh, who was an author, who is an author of almost black, right? He could not get into medical, uh, medical school. But then, uh, then when the moment he posed as a black man, and no matter how rich, uh, how much uh, information he released uh, to the automation uh, uh, committee, he got, he got tons of offers from the top medical schools immediately, right? And his work was that he's an Indian American, right? Um, his words was that, uh, hey, the rich, rich, race-based affirmative action only benefit the rich people in a certain group. So that's it. Proposition is a race-based uh, affirmative action, and we are not going that way. So it's so the be clear that, that proposition. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Please be, be clear that the proper um, two, 209, proposition 209 did not, does not ban affirmative action. We still have affirmative actions here, all right? It only bans affirmative action which are based, in, based on race and gender and the origin of the country. But That's you could it. argue these, the, the, the preferential treatments are towards those of, um, you know, through legacy admissions, through this wealth yeah. largely benefit people who are affluent. But, to, but l l let me get into your group. Uh, you were telling me that in your group and, and in your circle of friends who include uh, people who've moved here from India, people who work in the tech industry, uh, that you have fears about you know, removing this ban on affirmative action. What are your fears? Yeah, my fear is that we lose a ground that everybody uh, would be treated as equal, right? So my group, my circle, I have friends. I have friends who are working as a gas station, all right, as a teller. And uh, she was by no means rich. And she's not in the tech. And uh, if you put uh, her daughter and uh, uh, together with uh, Obama's daughter, then with this proposition uh, 16, um, maybe Obama daughter will be more preferred, right? So that will be really, really unfair to the lady who works at the gas station. So that's my friend, and I know I know her, and I know uh, her family will be harmed by this proposition 16, and for no reason, for no good reason. We are not making any progress here. So you've started uh, StopProp16.org. What are you going to be doing the next few weeks up until election day to reach people, who are you going to try to reach and what are you, what are you going to be saying to them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. So we have the largest number of volunteers. So far we have 4,000 uh, volunteers working across the state, right? So we have done 15 car rallies protesting Proposition 16 and we got a lot of allies a lot, uh, 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 along the way. 
and we are going to do the similar things all the way up to election. And right now, our cities are connected. All right, so we are doing the uh, street canvas, and we are passing away, passing out our, the fly, flyers, and we are installing our no two purpose sixteen uh, yard signs. So, and we are having meetings in our in the council council meetings all over the uh, state in each each city. So we don't have money, but we have human power. We are grassroots. We have grassroots yeah. power. You know, the last question I have for you, Tony, it, the supporters of Prop 16 talk about this ban on affirmative action as being an example of this structural racism that's, that's so much part of yeah. the discussion in our society, so much the source of protests uh, around the country. Um, What's it, what's it, what's your reaction? Do you do you see how yeah. uh, this ban is is keeping black and Latino uh, high school graduates out of certain colleges and universities? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's a ban on race, racial affirmative action, right? Uh, let's take a George Floyd. Uh, he's from he's from where Minnesota state, right? That state does not have anything like a proposition 209. So it's interesting that the year side, even our respected region, uh, whatever, uh, bosses, right? They use this uh, case to say that we have a systemic um, uh, racism system here, but if getting rid of a proposition 209 can solve that problem, why do we still have geology flow incidents there in Minnesota, where we do not we do not have anything like Proposition 209. I yeah. I would really like to discuss with the year side people. Uh, hey friends, tell me why George Floyd was treated unfairly without Proposition 209. You know when you when you schedule that civil discussion, give me the Zoom link and I'll definitely join you because I want oh, I want yeah, to hear yeah. that. Well, maybe me. you can help us. Right, maybe you can help us to set up that meeting. Let's well, discuss. we're going to have to talk. We're going to have to talk about policing. And let me give you a recommendation. Frontline. I just watched the Frontline documentary. Documentary. Uh, policing the police. It's very good. Um, so that's a recommendation. Tony, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, Tony uh, Guan is the board member with the Silicon Valley Chinese Association Foundation. That's in the Silicon Valley. Uh, let's move on to uh, Audrey Dow. Uh, Audrey Dow is the senior vice president with the Campaign for College Opportunity. Um, Audrey, I've talked to you uh, many times over the years. Your group uh, is an advocacy group that advocates uh, on higher education policy issues. Um, you, you, through your organization, you're doing some work for the Yes on 16 uh, side. But one of the things, the new things I learned about you, which I had never asked you before, was I learned that you were uh, raised in Los Angeles by an uh, immigrant Mexican family and that you gained admission to Brown University before affirmative action was banned, before uh, 209. Um, and I want to talk about your personal so story. So can you tell me a bit about uh, what you remember about affirmative action, what you heard about it as a high school student? Uh, you went to Garfield, right? I did, and very proud, a very proud bulldog. I'm sorry to all the Rough Riders who may be listening in tonight, but uh, definitely supportive of all of our East Los Angeles Boyle Heights high schools. Um, you know, I went to Garfield High School between 1989 and 1993. And, um, you know, I went to Garfield at a time when, you know, there weren't thousands and thousands of us thinking about college, but many of us knew um, many of us knew that education was going to be our way um, to reach our parents' immigrant dreams, to get that California dream, to, to own a home, to have a retirement account. And we knew that college was the way that we were going to do that. And, you know, Adolfo, it's not lost on me because, you know, if you ask my 12th grade self what structural racism was, or maybe even what affirmative action was, I wouldn't know what it, what, it would have, what it was at that age. But what I did know were two things. One is that I wanted to put my best foot forward for college like many of my friends did. 
And I wanted to get into a number of different AP classes. And what I had to do the summer before um, each of my high school years was read a number of books, study a bunch of different, you know, problems in math and science. And I'd have to sit down with about 200 of my peers for a test that was directly related to an AP course. It could have been an AP English test, an AP you know, history test, AP calculus test, to see who of those 200 students would get the coveted spot in the AP class. Because Garfield at the time did not have an a- enough AP teachers to teach all of the students who were trying to get into an AP class. That's still the reality today that you know, we live in such, in, in such as Latinos, Blacks, Hmong, Vietnamese community live, live in these highly racially segregated neighborhoods with under-resourced high schools, where even a student like me who wanted to take an AP course yeah. and get it what was really limited. But what I knew on the positive side was that there would be and could be a spot for me at the UC because my college counselors told me, my teachers told me that UC was a welcoming spot. And sure enough, many of my friends and myself included did find a spot at the University of California I when to, we applied. I, I wanted to ask you about something that one of our earlier guests um, said. Uh, so when I asked uh, Gail Harriet, one of the original proponents of 209 about the divisiveness of 209, she took issue with that. And, um, You know what? I was uh, in my 20s in the 1990s, and I remember very vividly Prop 187, and Prop 187 would have affected, um, you know, some of my relatives. Um, You know, Prop 209 would have affected me um, earlier uh, as I was applying to college. And then uh, the ban on on bilingual education, um, you know, later on in the 90s also uh, would would have affected me. So, um, you know what, she's not here to answer, but it was divisive. <laughs> it was divisive because it was most, a divisive m- most of those, most of those, those three propositions uh, really targeted, um, you know, Mexican and Central American uh, immigrants, right? Um, but my question to you is, what, what do you remember about that time around 1996 when uh, Proposition 209 won and uh, affirmative action was banned? Well, I remember distinctly being um, at Cal with a a number of friends of mine. Um, There was a UC Irvine student, an anteater. There was a gaucho, a UCLA Bruin, and a Cal Bear with me. Um, And we were sitting outside one evening at Cal and talking about how we were the lucky ones, Adolfo, that we got in before what was, I would call a trifecta of hate policies that were really stimming our dreams, the dreams of the younger siblings we had that were coming behind us, our cousins, and really thinking about what might our shots be for graduate school? What might our shots be, you know, if we wanted to go into the, you know, and to be professors? Um, And we knew all of us were thriving at, you know, at our respective colleges and said, you know, we were fully qualified students to be and have a spot at the University of California and the colleges where we were. But we were so grateful that the system, that the state had the foresight to say there's, that structural racism is real. And we have to consider that as one of many factors. And it was just a nasty time. And I, I, I worry that today, when I think about my children that were entering into another nasty time of xenophobia, of thinking and trying to believe that that race doesn't matter anymore when when it does. Um, well, and let, let me ask you this: the, um, the demographics are very different in California, in the electorate and in the population at large. Um, many more Latinos uh, on the voter rolls and uh, in the population and in, in the California State University and the University of California, which leads me to a point made earlier, uh, which I said um, that after 209, 
the University of California, Cal State University found workarounds. They found hacks to not being able to use race uh, and ethnicity as one factor in admissions. They found a way to reach out to black and Latino students where they were and that sort of thing. There are a lot, there are a lot more Latinos graduating from University of California, California State University, private universities too. Um, do you think you, your side, the Yes on 16 side has too steep a road to climb to convince enough voters that something's broken because it doesn't seem like something's broken in terms of banning affirmative action. I don't think we have a steep road at all. I think we definitely need to continue to get the word out. But Adolfo, when you think about the fact that Latino children um, are fifth, over 50% of our K-12 population, only 11% of Latino adults have a bachelor's degree. When Latinos, when you think about that the, the bare minimum for a good job in California today is a bachelor's degree, we are leaving our, one of our largest populations behind. And so uh, access to higher education is important. And the reason why you see incredible numbers of Latinos applying to our Cal State systems and, and UC systems and enrolling in our California community colleges is because Latino families understand that. They understand that a college education is key. And I think we have got to do everything to ensure that our students have access to our universities. And race has got to be one of those considerations amongst many. You know, okay. I, and I think our UC system got it. The reason why you saw a proliferation of looking at other types of things that the UC could do to recruit because they knew how special it was and how important it was to look at race, that they could not be race blind. And yeah. what we've seen in the data is that even when you cut for income, you still see racial di disparities. Even when you cut by geography, yeah. there are still racial disparities. So there's no proxy. There's no proxy for race. So uh, we're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Audrey Dow, uh, for joining. And I'd like to thank all the other guests who joined me uh, today. I really hope that uh, from hearing all of them, you have more information about Prop 16. And you know what? If you have even more questions, that's, that's great because you, then you can go to Ballotpedia, you can go to the League of Women Voters, you can go to see who the, who's endorsing the yes on 16, who's endorsing the no on 16, if that's how you make your decision. Do your homework, vote November 3rd. That's uh, one of the last messages uh, from me tonight. Inform yourself about all the candidates and all the issues. And I do want to also tell you that uh, there's a Prop 16, 15 event next week, uh, Tuesday, September 29th with David Wagner and Kyle Stokes, uh, two of my very talented colleagues uh, on the reporting uh, crew at KPCC. Uh, this uh, ballot measure uh, aims to overturn Prop 13 and um, re restructure the way property tax is calculated, potentially leading to increased funding for California schools. And uh, there's much more information on the voter game plan virtual events coming up. You can go to kpcc.org slash in person to see the full schedule. Thanks to everybody uh, for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone from the downtown Los Angeles Bureau for, of KPCC.